Hello YouTube, HP Zeta here again today and uh, yeah, um, I did some more changes to the set and I need to test everything out so I thought uh, what's a better time to try it than with the actual machine that's giving me problems. As you can see I've got a PlayStation 1 here with a PlayStation 1 LCD and it has been chipped by someone I don't know who and it doesn't want to read copy games. In this case, a Chinese silver that I had laying around. So, let's open it up and see what's wrong with it. The nice thing now is I'm going to be using my more expensive camera. Unfortunately, that means that I have to use a tripod. This normally isn't a problem, but as you can see, it's mounted in a bit of a strange place. But, not the end of the world. There we go. Also, if this video is upside down, it means that I can't flip this correctly in my recording software. That's going to suck though, but what can you do? Hopefully with the bigger camera you should have better focus on what I'm doing. It might pop in and out every now and then, but uh, it should be a huge improvement over yesterday's video, to say the least. So let's, let's top off, take the laser out. It's a motherboard. I just want to zoom in slightly a bit more. There we go. So let's see what we've got here. Uh, there's a chip. Eesh. The wires are quite badly soldered. Um, I don't know if you can see that over the camera. Um, the chip is just floating. A piece of paper there. Uh, no, there we go. <laughs> Instantly, we've got a problem here. There's a loose floating wire that really shouldn't be there. It's not connected to anything. Uh, poorly soldered, all connected together, and uh, that's just not, that's not how you do it. So let's fix this out. Chip itself, I'm sure there's nothing wrong with it. Uh, I'm going to remove this quickly. The big problem with PlayStation ones is they're very easy to chip, and as a result, sometimes you get amateurs chipping them and not doing the best of jobs. Okay, um, let's get rid of the paper. <laughs> I mean, I don't know what the the insulation properties are of paper, but I doubt that it works that great to insulate things. I'm just going to use my finger. There we go, that's gone. as good as it's going to get. I'm going to use some PCB clean just to see if it'll take off some of that glue. Clean up some of the points as well. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, that's 
Stay true to so little bits of piping in there. This PCB stuff is a miracle worker. It just works well on everything. I haven't used it to clean lasers. Um, it's plastic safe. It's doesn't corrode anything. So it's pretty cool stuff. And it's pretty volatile, so it evaporates very quickly. Um, within a couple of seconds, everything just disappears, leaving you with very little to clean up on. You can see some points where the person maybe was a bit unsure, <laughs> doesn't know how to do it properly. Nonetheless, I don't think it's wise to take it out on the chip. There's probably not much wrong with this. 100% <laughs> sure there's not much wrong with it. Just need some TLC. This water is a bit dry. I don't want to add too much solder at this stage because I still want to bend and cut the pins correctly. So I don't like that, I don't like that too much. That's everything removed. Let's straighten those pins up, shall we? This can be salvaged. What I tend to do is I don't use the whole chip on these big chips. I just cut off a little part there. Put those somewhere safe. And that's normally what I use to chip with if it doesn't disappear. <laughs> there you go. It's a lot thinner, a lot easier to work with. You don't have wires going everywhere. Unnecessarily needs and things like that either. Right, and here we are again, back with the machine. Here I've got my chip. You'll see that I stuck it to some double-sided adhesive packing. Um, it's electronic safe, I get it from the electronic store. It's a bit overpriced, it costs quite a bit, but for what it does, it's probably the best stuff for sticking down ICs and random parts. It doesn't move once you have it off, and you can actually fold it double. I'll show you now. Move that side, there we go. It, it does two things, it insulates at the bottom and also it adds an adhesive surface that you can use. So I'm following those two flat. I know that pin number 8 is crowned, so the best position probably to keep this in. But I'm going to do pin number 4 and 3 on top and then everything else goes at the bottom so 
what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to stick it that way around. And don't worry about the pads at the bottom, it's as luck would have it that's insulated now, they're not going to touch. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, I'm going to grab my yellow wire, same stuff I used last night, and let's get cracking. Hopefully you can see what I mean by heating up the pin and it moving backwards a bit better today. There you go. I like to have very good mechanical connection on positive and ground. Um, it's just, it's a good habit to get into if you know what I mean. Later on, when you start doing more complicated things, if you don't have a good power and ground connected, you'll get into trouble. Yeah, that pulls away. And the secret of chipping any machine is you don't want to overheat anything. The secret to solder is the exact same. Just place your soldering line there for a couple of seconds. Always use fresh salt and you'll have nice, like shiny points, non-dull, um, they'll be pretty bright and that's what you want to see. Let's get power sorted. I'm not using the scalpel today to, to cut the wires because um, you can't really apply a lot of pressure on the chip with just adhesive holding it down logically it'll cause a lot of problems for you very very quickly The problem with using this technique is it gets a bit more difficult to keep track of everything. The wires are a bit longer, they're not as neat, but you know what, I'd rather functional wires than uh, broken non-working wires. And what I'm going to do with these points is instead of having it flat like that, take it straight up. and have the chip support itself a little bit um, instead of having it straight and taut when it gets a bit hot in summer or cool in winter the wires actually expand and contract so in doing so okay it, they sometimes do lose contact if you don't solder them properly especially like the case of where the chip this originally Okay, let's flip this around. Even if I pre-tin the wires by actually removing the old chip a couple of seconds ago, Sometimes as they dull out quite quickly, or the original solar that was used wasn't very good quality. So I normally just, if I see one that's bad, just heat it quickly. 
it makes a big difference. PS1s are actually one of the easiest systems to chip comparatively. Um, very good system to start on. They're cheap, there's lots of them in supply and uh, easy to fix as well. Just about everything has a fuse connected to it on the PlayStation 1. So if you mess something up, you can easily see where you fit you the drum and fix that out and then all you have to do is just rebridge that fuse and you're sorted. That one it doesn't look that great. I'm just going to go from this direction. See once you start doing adding old solder you get blunt solder points and just not only does it not look good, you know that that point within a couple of weeks is going to give way and break. And then you've got a problem. <laughs> you have to go in and fix it again. And that's the last thing you want to do. Maybe you're unlucky and it's the power point for instance and that lifts up, connects to ground somewhere and blows your whole system. Mind you, the chances of that actually happening is slim to none. Um, it's just pretty good to actually be aware that that sort of thing can happen and just try not to do it <laughs> be careful look what you're doing there we go sorry I've, I've got my topics that I want to talk about on the computer so every so now and then I have to go and uh, change it to the next page to keep me on track I'm trying to be a bit more formal than I normally am and I'm hoping that will show my videos because that's something that we really need is some formal good quality repair videos um, there are already quite a few people doing some amazing works uh, like Luke Morse does some excellent excellent repairs Luke Morse one now I'll link him in my uh, description I think if possible and that one. I actually think this is probably going to be a bit longer than the GameCube video I guess we'll see in a couple of minutes I might actually have to stop this video and continue it Oh, that's incorrect. I made a mistake there. <laughs> well, everyone makes mistakes, and all you have to do is just lift up the wire. And just solder it to the correct place. This one consoles are very forgiving, so like I said before, it's an excellent console for beginners to start with. In fact, my first tutorial online was a PS1 chip, and uh, it was the old Crows one, and uh, that, that, that's a lot different to this, a lot less wires. Mind you, it doesn't do multi-disc support, doesn't do stealth. Um, on Slimlines and PS1, oh sorry, PS1 consoles, doesn't even properly patch um, things like uh, the video PAL mode so you can't play NTSC games unless you have a boot disk of some sort so for all the time being the one chip is still the best there isn't a port though for the one chip over to new microcontrollers I hope that someday someone will do that that will be great you can get the MM3 chips now on uh, 
Pick 16F 629s, um, which is the same as the All Crow chips as well. They're also compatible with that now. And the MM3 actually for flat machines, oh, there's nothing wrong with it. It's a perfect chip. It plays everything well. And, uh, stealth mode. It works very well. So you can program your own ones at home. Another thing is, I like keeping them as close to the motherboard if I can. If I'm running them over an IC or something, I don't mind if they're over. But if it's down on the board, it should actually be on top of the board itself. Like that. Okay, down to the last two wires, because I do want to keep this thing stealth. Done. One last one, which is number two. And now I'm going to have to take that one up and around as well. I don't like sticking wires on top of the chip, but if I take it this way around, I'll just be wasting wire. I think I can get the length down by taking it the opposite way around. And that actually goes to this point here. Now they're fairly close together, but the secret of soldering is solder. solder the secret of soldering is solder will actually only stick to a point that's heated up. So if you only heat the center resistor and you've got a steady hand and that's the only one getting heat, it's not going to move over to the others. It's, it's going to stay there, nice and still, waiting for you to finish off. Just ensure that the chip doesn't move off the black couple of years or anything like that. I'm going to use some tape here. This is heat resistant tape. Um, it works and still adheres up to 300 degrees Celsius over the normal room temperature. So if you, you've got like 350 degrees Celsius this will still actually stick the chip down, so it's a very good quality tape to use when modding. Ah, ran out of time there. I'm not going to be able to clean those points there. Um, they're on the chip already, the orbital flux around it won't make contact with the one next to it, so that'll be fine. I'm just going to grab some a new Q-tip, contact clean. Go over my points, take off all of the excess flux. Okay. 
I don't know if that shows up on camera, but at the point there, it might look to you like it's bridging with the one behind. It's not, it's a couple of centimeters or millimeters just above the, the RC. So that's fine. It'll work just like that. Let's close it off. I'm not going to close it fully as I also want to show you what it looks like when one of the discs read what the laser does. Also on the LCD screen it is going to jump when I start the system. That's fairly normal. It might jump with the game as well. I can't remember if this is a PAL copy or NTSC copy. Who knows? And that's normal. Um, the one chip patches the video signal in PAL, so the LC doesn't have a way to react to the new video signal. It's designed to only accept 100% PAL signal. If it sees a slight NTSC signal or any picture at 60 Hz, it freaks out. But if the game is PAL, it should center. It's not a PAL game. <laughs> but the chip's working. Staff lab on the chips working, everything is working. I think I've got some power lines. Give me a second. Let's get out another game. Let's see if I've got a power one. Oh, no, what I can do, just to show you, what I can do is here's the original. Final Fantasy Power. Stick that in. I actually think that's disc free. See, there's the LCD screen again. I'm just putting it up so you can see. And as soon as the game starts, it will reset the video signal. And the video signal has been reset and it stopped jumping. <laughs> I'll wait for the music to start just to show you. It's all working. And there we go. Everything's working again, I'm happy. And now I know that this machine will last me for the next 10 years. Or well, however long the laser in the system lasts. If you like this video, it is more of a test than anything else, just to see if the new camera interface is working. Please comment, rate and subscribe. If you haven't already, please check my actual channel. I've got lots of other videos that you can look out for. At the moment most of the videos are actually only viewed by subscribers and uh, I don't mind that because all my su subscribers rock. They're all great people. So thanks to them for making all of these videos possible because I wouldn't be making these if people didn't watch them. And I'm just quickly going to close this off and then uh, that's the end of it. I hope you enjoyed. Goodbye. Okay, before I show you a bit more about why the screen jumps on the PlayStation 1 LCD versus normal, I thought I'll show you the new setup. Basically, the new camera fits in there, points directly down, and that goes to my work desk. I still have the light and all the 
only problem with this is I can only use my cell phone, the Samsung Galaxy S3 and uh, for all of the things that's great with it, um, the white balance on the camera in this environment doesn't work properly so that's why things looked a bit odd last time and I hope this will solve it so just to show you here what I meant by the screen doesn't support NTSC properly switch it on the one chip is outputting PAL60 at the moment that's why it's flickering but the LCD really only wants pure PAL signal but on the main LCD you can see that it's perfectly fine as that one actually supports NTSC and PAL There you go, Crash Bandicoot. Same thing with the original. Guess there isn't much that that 2 meg memory can hold. <laughs> Switch it on. It's giving PAL 60, so it's flickering. There you go. And uh, the actual LCD screen, I've got connected, it works, it has a lot of different inputs. Um, I've got a universal cable connected to Wi-Fi PR. That's this here. <laughs> it supports quite a few systems, but not PS1, unfortunately. But I've also got my PC connected to it. Okay. That's where my notes were just now. So there you have it. I hope you guys enjoyed and if you like my video please comment, rate and subscribe. Thanks again and until next time. Um, hopefully next time I'll have something a lot more complicated for you guys because now I know the system works and I can do some major things. I'm thinking of doing a Super CIC for a Nintendo 64 next. Um, that's a definite so I'll give that a go and let you guys know thank you very much for watching and until next time goodbye